Um, so I thought that uh, I, I can talk to you a bit about the Open Science Grid in general, what uh, uh, services we provide, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if you have uh, any at this point. Uh, the Open Science Grid is a consortium of about uh, 80 national laboratories and universities that work together to form a national cyber infrastructure. It's not the only cyber infrastructure. In fact, later on there will be discussions about Terra Grid, and, and then there are other uh, grid infrastructures that are coming up, uh, especially campus grid infrastructures. Um, the Open Science Grid uh, um, is characterized uh, by uh, high, throughput, high throughput computing. So the consortium put together several, federates several sites that provide access to um, their computing resources via standard grid interfaces. Now these computing resources uh, are typically um, clusters of uh, out of the box uh, computers. Uh, we do have in the Open Science Grid a few um, supercomputers, but the bulk of it uh, is a com cluster computing. So um, the focus of the grid is then uh, what I was calling high throughput computing, which is uh, um, not really focusing on the performance of each individual job, but making sure that the flow of job and science outcome can be steady throughout uh, all the time that you need to use it. Um, in the Open Science Grid, there is this concept uh, of a virtual organization. So these are scientific communities uh, that uh, they typically have a common, uh, a common uh, program of work. Um, and uh, these communities may be internally structured. There may be a hierarchy of groups and roles. Um, and the Open Science Grid gives access to resources to the communities rather than to the individual the individual members of, of the community. We have an authorization infrastructure that allows uh, uh, virtual organization to organize uh, together with the sites uh, their access privileges based on their internal organizational structure. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that uh, often people ask about the Open Science Grid is how do we get access to the computing? What do we do to uh, run our job uh, on the infrastructure? Um, there are various services uh, in the Open Science Grid that are offered to virtual organization to help uh, this process. And there are, in fact, various technologies that are used uh, to allow people to get access to, to these various computers. If you are interested in uh, having access to, to resources on the Open Science Grid, one of the first things that you might want to do, well, you can certainly contact me, or you can uh, contact, you can start attending the VIO forum. Um, this forum is a group of uh, experts in various domains um, that essentially help uh, an engagement program of the community. One of, just to give you an example, right? Uh, one of the communities that we have recently worked with is the LSSD community. We had contacts here at Purdue, in fact. Um, Ian Shipsy from the Physics Building, um, uh, John Peterson. What we did with these people to allow them to get access to the Open Science Grid resources was a program of three phases of engagement. At this point, we are at phase two of, uh, we have completed phase two. And essentially what we did, we started working together, understanding what the main requirements of the computation were. And uh, we had an initial phase one, which was a simple proof of principle. So um, essentially being able to run uh, the one, one of their image simulation for the, for the telescope on the grid. This was made of 189 jobs because of the structure of the, the detector, et cetera, et cetera. They had certain data requirement and so on and so forth. What we did was giving them access um, to what we call a submission site. From this submission site, uh, uh, working with us, uh, we have wrapped their application around um, OSG specific scripts, which essentially what they do, they, they land on a node, they look around, they set up their own environment, uh, they try to recognize where the software is installed, uh, they have access to various open science grid services, and, uh, uh, and then they launch the actual application. 
at the end of this, uh, th there are some uh, bookkeeping, some uh, wrapping up of the output, and the output then is shipped back, or it's stored on some of the storage elements, uh, some of the resources. Um, now, we started to do this with them in February, and in about a month uh, working with them, they could successfully run this proof of principle. Later in the summer, we had instead a second phase of engagement where we went from the simple proof of principle, so running one image simulation, to running 1,000, which is a number that made sense for them because this is the number of images that the, the, the telescope can take in one night. So we had to change our approach because clearly doing one image or doing 1,000 images, so that the amount of computation was, was very different. Um, in the end, we were able to get to, for them uh, 50,000 CPU hours per day uh, steady uh, for about 20 days. We had uh, often, uh, so 50,000 CPU hours, as you know, correspond to about 2,000 uh, CPUs available. Often we had 4,000, and in fact 4,000 was about the average. And then we had peak of 6,000 resources. And uh, we had to change uh, the technology that we used to, to get them access to the resources. And now we are going into a phase three where uh, we propose for them to start uh, you installing themselves some of these interfaces, some of these submission sites to let them give access, get, get access to, to the actual open science grid resources. So we went from a phase one, which is a proof of principle, to a phase two, which is uh, almost production scale, to a phase three where the community takes ownership of the infrastructure needed to access the open science grid. They start running their own steady production and we help them as a support activity when there are problems accessing the resources, there are problems with the middleware of the submission site, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I mentioned that they were able to access uh, 4,000 CPUs a day, uh, and they did that for about 20 days. Uh, let me give you uh, and some numbers to let you understand the size of the open science grid, et cetera. Now, the open science grid runs about a million two hundred thousand CPU hours per day. So these are about a bit more than 50, between 50,000, 60,000 CPU slots, if you want, available. If you look at the distribution uh, of uh, what communities use what, uh, uh, what um, percentage of these computational hours, uh, about a fourth, one-fourth of this uh, is used by the CMS collaboration. One-fourth of this is used by the Atlas, Atlas collaboration. And so these are, uh, you know, two big players from LHC experiments, high energy physics. And then we have the rest that is shared between other high energy physics experiments like the D0 and CDF uh, communities at, at Fermilab, the, the run to experiment at Fermilab. And then we have a non-high energy physics uh, communities. We count for about 20% of the overall utilization. And 10% the, the of this, well, 50% of this 20%, so you know, only 10% of the overall is used by the LIGO community. So um, if you look at the amount of uh, CPU hours that are offered opportunistically, so w when I say opportunistically, I mean that uh, uh, resources are not guaranteed to you. This portion is about one third of this uh, overall one million plus hours of, of CPU, um, uh, CPU hours per day. And uh, the model is that uh, institutions and sites uh, typically are designed by their own communities for a peak usage. Um, but then these communities uh, often do not run at peak. So when you have your own community, uh, these resources may stay idle. So if you federate these resources with other resources and you open up then your, your own resources to the communities, when, when the, the main owner of the resources does not use them, then other communities can get access to them in an opportunistic way. So you have really no guarantee that the resources are there, but uh, you know, if they are not used, then you, you are welcome to use them. 
And so this is the overall model of the open science grid where you know, sites get together, there is this fluctuation of utilization of the resources and, and then um, communities spill over their, their cycles on other sites that are not currently fully, uh, fully utilized. And so, um, right, 400,000 uh, CPU hours per day makes it possible for several communities that want to use the grid opportunistically to, to get, in fact, a large chunk of this. I, I said 50,000 hours, f between 50 and 100,000 hours for, for LSST, for example, was what we were able to, to obtain for them. Um, now, the main goal of the open science grid is uh, scientific output. So the funding agencies, which by the way are uh, SIDAC2, so DOE and NSF, uh, fund the open science grid as a common cyber infrastructure to allow the, uh, the science to, to essentially increase their throughput. Uh, often uh, scientists that they have a strong uh, science case may not be experts uh, in, uh, in the computing infrastructure. And uh, the open science grid, among the other thing, uh, when, when the open science grid partners with these communities, uh, we also offer some expertise, uh, uh, some um, uh, fora where people can come and talk about their science, learn about the infrastructure, and essentially support also to use the cyber infrastructure. Uh, one minute, okay. Um, just to give you a number, uh, last year the Open Science Grid helped to publish uh, something like 370 publications. And 20% of these, uh, actually 25% of these were non-high energy physics. So, uh, well, I guess my time is over. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, um, maybe after the, the other speakers have talked. Uh, so thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'm gonna, uh, since uh, Gabriel didn't use any PowerPoints, I thought everybody is waiting for PowerPoints, so um, I'm gonna go through some of them. Um, so what I like to do is really to just highlight um, a number of things with Cherigrid and how to, um, what are the resources and how to get access and, um, and um, leave time for you to ask questions at the end. Um, let's see. So basically, I'd like to cover, uh, just give a quick overview of what is Cherigrid, who can use it, how to get access, and some of the uh, information regarding where you can get help. So Cherigrid, for those who uh, heard it for the first time, it's a national cyber infrastructure funded by NSF. Um, it's basically a network of resources uh, and uh, provide also providing integrated services. And the bulk of it, uh, in terms of resources, the bulk of it is uh, high performance computing resources. And there are also um, other, what we call special services and also data storage and uh, science gateway and a number of related uh, tools and, and applications. And uh, as you can see on the bottom, the, um, a lot of the, these detailed information can be found at the main Terragrid website. And um, here's a map, our, one of our favorite maps showing uh, who's who on Terragrid. So all these red dots are resource providers. So basically Terragrid is organized as uh, a set of um, 11 to going to be 12 resource providers each putting up uh, resources um, to the high-speed network. And Terragrid is uh, also coordinated by a single, um, what we call coordination body called uh, the Grid Infrastructure Group, uh, or GIG for short. And uh, so up there you can see from the West Coast San Diego Supercomputing Center, uh, NCSA in the middle, Purdue, IU, and uh, also um, Pittsburgh. And one of the newest member is uh, Georgia Tech. They have a new exper experimental high performance computing system that's gonna come online uh, soon. Um, we can talk about the resources in more detail later. 
Um, so it, it's worthwhile to kind of review what the uh, objectives are when the target proposal is written. So um, the first and foremost is uh, the deep science. That's what people call it. Basically, science that um, the, uh, requires very high-end uh, computational resources and data resources that are not available uh, typically at a campus level. And there's also the wide aspect of TerraGrid, which um, really aims at broadening access, allowing a um, lot more people, researchers and students, to access resources on the TerraGrid. So this includes people who, uh, who are doing um, computational science, but uh, are limited by campus resources, as well as those scientific domains that um, don't typically use uh, high-end computation resources. And there's also the aspect of open um, for TerraGrid to um, implement uh, interoperability with other cyber infrastructures. And here is a snapshot of um, kind of what applications, what domains are using TerraGrid. I believe this is a little outdated. This year's annual report will probably present um, somewhat different picture, but I think in general, uh, the overall picture uh, will remain the same. So there you can see pretty much uh, the, the domains uh, of scientists that are using TerraGrid pretty much uh, are across all the na uh, National Science Foundation's directorates and with uh, molecular sciences and uh, um, astronomy studies, probably the biggest one, and there's another one, physics. Um, so these are just give you an, an idea that um, what kind of uh, um, numbers that people love to, to chew on. Um, also, in terms of how they're using TerraGrid resources, you can see that the bulk of it, um, in terms of number of projects, are really using the batch compu uh, computing resources, which is you know, the case where people submit their jobs, let their jobs run for days or weeks, and then look at the results. And um, there are also projects that are um, more exploratory, and there are a number of projects that um, use uh, significantly uh, of the workflow ensemble parameter suite type of resources. And um, Science Gateway is uh, one of the initiatives under TerraGrid. Uh, it started about maybe three, four years ago. Um, so these are sort of, um, if you compare it with Open Science Grid, this kind of a, uh, uh, is an analogy to the VO concept. That it's a group of people uh, with a common interest in uh, build uh, tools that can access TerraGrid and then let the let their user community use it without individually acquiring TerraGrid accounts. And there is also the uh, interactive computation uh, such as visualization. Um, since we're Having this at Purdue, so I'm just going to put in a few words about Purdue. So the Purdue's uh, um, role in TerraGrid uh, started in 2005 when we started with a very uh, small recyc uh, recycled cluster on TerraGrid. And as time went by, we uh, um, refreshed the resources, and right now, a part of Steel cluster is uh, a TerraGrid resources and also the TerraGrid users can access the larger clusters through our standby queues, which has a time limit, but they can get to uh, run a much wider jobs than uh, the nodes that TerraGrid owns. And Purdue also has uh, the, the Condor pool on TerraGrid as the, the only high throughput um, computing resources in the mix. And um, this picture shows um, a very similar um, graph for the kind of scientific fields that are using uh, the resources at Purdue. 
And um, there are a great number of science uh, projects running on TerraGrid. Every year, uh, TerraGrid puts out uh, two uh, highlights brochures. One is um, a collection of stories uh, of science applications that have been um, executed on TerraGrid. And this is uh, the newest one this year. Um, we're really proud of one of our staff members uh, on the TerraGrid team that he's worked with uh, in collaboration with uh, one of the uh, Purdue Communications faculty uh, who's studying the uh, um, interaction and collaboration behaviors of internet users on social networks uh, uh, or social, what do you call it, uh, Wikipedia type of uh, systems. And so this is a graph that shows the um, relationship between users and the articles they edit uh, and giving the researchers insight on the behavior, um, the characteristics of the behavior that they are um, probably different from what's perceived um, by a lot of people. And uh, there is also a brochure um, every year that highlights the uh, education use of the terror grid. Um, and uh, all these are available, and um, I have information at the end of the slide that, um, that you can find. And every year there's an annual conference where people showcase their scientific work and uh, um, various visualization uh, showcase pieces posters and student competitions. Um, so it's a major fair for the uh, Terrigal community and the next year is in Salt Lake City in July. Um, so when it comes to the um, list of resources, the, the Terrigal resources have been changing. The new ones uh, are uh, being funded um, periodically and um, the, the major uh, computational resources there are three categories, the massively parallel uh, systems and shared memory systems and the um, clusters. And there are also a number of visualization resources. And um, the high throughput uh, Condor resources comes from Purdue, which is also on the open science grid. And this map shows you roughly, you know, the size of these um, resources in terms of computational power. And uh, the largest one right now is Kraken at uh, Oak Ridge. Okay, so um, that's a lot of uh, different resources. Every resource has, um, are good for different things. So people usually have questions. The first question would be, how do I get access? And um, we, our team usually tell people, you know, sometimes people uh, say, I don't, uh, for example, at Purdue, they say we don't have notes on the community clusters and I have nowhere to go to run my code that needs um, 128 cores. And we always tell them, yes, there is a free resource that you can go, which is called TerraGrid. So TerraGrid is free for all U.S. researchers and their partners if uh, the par partners are international. And um, there are different types of what we call allocations where um, you can get time on various resources. And the application is online. And usually you have a faculty or researcher uh, uh, serve as PI and then you can add the students from the group uh, into that same allocation and share the time you get on TerraGrid. Um, so still, you know, people say, how do I get started? And um, the, the one resource, I, there are many um, TerraGrid services and help you can find if you're very diligent and uh, dedicated. Now, the one resource that I like to point out is the Campus Champion Program uh, ter uh, with TerraGrid. So the idea there is that you have these uh, representatives on each campus who has the knowledge of TerraGrid, who has accounts that uh, they can add you to it so you can get started right away. 
And they also, um, I heard rumors, they have direct ac access to terrorist staff, so they sort of have a f uh, fast path. Um, so um, the leader of this program is uh, Purdue's Kay Hunt, who's also uh, the organizer of this uh, event. And um, I also um, has a title, although she, ha she already has many titles, I have another title, Champion of the Champions, which is our very own uh, Kim Dillman. So uh, even though she's out of Purdue, uh, she's available to a, a lot of campus champions uh, at other campuses, and um, she's really good about answering questions. So I put her picture there so uh, you can uh, um, ask her questions afterwards. Um, okay, and some of the things that, uh, I'm showing two examples that what uh, Kim does to help users. Um, in this matrix, complex matrix of all the resources, different characteristics and, and usage modes, um, it's very hard to navigate for a new user you know, which one do I apply and how much time do I need and all sorts of questions. And Kim um, came up with a, a tutorial that really helps people to sort these things. And she even has the ABCs of TerraGrid. I've never seen such things from TerraGrid, so um, that should be help. And uh, this is another example that Kim created because there's so much information um, she actually came up with a spreadsheet that uh, tells you uh, almost like everything you ever want to know about Terrigal resources. That's what I call it. And then you basically go to the spreadsheet and you can find um, something that fits your needs. Um, so uh, basically the takeaway points for these are um, it's free. Uh, you sh if, if you do compu computation, you should uh, consider using it and help really is not that far away, uh, even though uh, sometimes when people think of Terrigrid, oh, there's a Terrigrid Central, it's somewhere in NCSA, uh, we don't know their phone number or, or things like that, but um, you can look around your campus, in um, worst case, you can always get hold of Kim, and she'll help you. And I, I'll um, put up the uh, all this information, and um, feel free to contact us. The main site, uh, if you want to find out more information, it's at terrigrid.org. And uh, there is a resource catalog there. It describes every resource, uh, Terrigrid resource that, it's available, uh, that is available right now in their status. Some of the resources are new and uh, they're probably in pre-production uh, status. But that's the place to go. And uh, there is also, pr for, for specific to Purdue resources, the Purdue has a Terrigo website. And to access the system, a lot of people, the, the veterans of uh, high performance computing, they just do SSH from whatever client tools uh, of their favorite. And um, for people who are new, there's also, ac uh, you can also access from the um, Terrigo user portal. And uh, Purdue also, uh, putting out a, a hub zero based web portal for accessing TerraGrid and uh, we're in uh, early release and we're um, um, soliciting early users for that. And that's um, pretty much what I like to say. Hello everybody. As you heard, I'm the project manager for Blue Waters and I spent all my time with the nitty gritty details. And so it's so exciting from time to time to come and see the high level picture and get excited about the project again, not be so frustrated. <laughs> so um, Blue Waters, um, it's part of the NSF uh, strategy for um, high performance computing. Um, NSF envisioned this on three levels. Track three, their university resources. Track two, more ambitious um, computational resources, which are also part of TerraGrid, and Carol just talked about several of those. And we're at the next level, track one, a very powerful uh, system that will 
uh, reach a sustained petaflop performance. And this is the actual text that we had in, um, in the solicitation that came from NSF. And what they're saying there, and you have to parse this, we're talking about petascale performance, but we're talking about sustained petascale performance. And I think this is the most important difference uh, in what we're doing. We're not so interested in the peak performance, we're interested in sustained performance. And why is that? Because we want to serve the users. We want to give them a system that they can use for different areas, for different types of algorithms, for different uh, research topics. Um, therefore, we're not only interested in the performance per core or the parallel performance, but we're also interested, as the solicitation actually said, um, in the amount of memory that we're uh, putting at the disposal of these users and um, um, the, the type of I.O. that will enable them to work with large data sets. You just mentioned uh, LSST, and that's a perfect candidate for this kind of a system. And here is what, we're think what we had in mind when we started the specs for this computer. We, we talked to different vendors, and this is what we came up with. And the, the way we came up with this was to talk, by talking to different people. We talked to several researchers from many universities. We even talked to people from uh, industry. We talked to people from Boeing, from other areas, to see what do you actually need? Where does it hurt? What do, don't you have at this moment? What does a new system need to provide? And. Um, Based on what I heard here earlier, I will go really fast over this next slides, which talk more about the architecture of the system. Um, I look back, and there were several talks I put to you about the Blue Water system, and I don't think that's so relevant here. It's mostly about how do you get access to the system. To make it plainly clear, this is, this is not a system that's on the floor yet, but it will be soon. And um, this is what at the, at the Smallest level, two new chips that came from IBM, a computational chip and an interconnect chip. And this is a very uh, new architecture, very ambitious. And uh, we're building it up. These, um, the chips, they, they are put in a quad module. Then we have these drawers, building racks, and then blue waters. And, um, what we're trying to achieve, and here I'm comparing our system to Kraken, which is what we consider the most powerful system in Terragrid at this moment. And um, you see, oh, there's one more here, that we're very ambitious on several levels. Uh, we want to achieve a peak performance that's about four times larger than the, the one currently available. Um, look, for example, at the memory bandwidth. Uh, we will have around 300,000 cores, uh, which is a little bit more than than what, oh, oh this is comparison with Jaguar, sorry, that's what I meant, Jaguar. Um, um, but the chips are actually more powerful. Um, very, um, very powerful in terms of the storage and this transfer. We, uh, established this partnership with IBM, and IBM is under a contractual obligation to deliver to us the hardware and the software that will make this machine run. Um, we looked at this, we have a lot of collaborators from the computer science department and realized that there are some areas where University of Illinois and some of other partners are very strong, so we're complementing the, the software that is delivered by IBM through pieces that we develop in-house. And here the color coding of that software system, blue is IBM and then the orange goes Illinois and we have some areas where we collaborate. Um, so we're trying to establish a very powerful software environment, both in terms of system software, but also in terms of user software, recognizing the challenges that come from programming to such a large number of cores. Um, user environments, debuggers, all these tools have to go to a level of uh, sophistication that is unprecedented. 
um, University of Illinois is also providing the storage for this um, system. We have online storage that is part of the machine itself, but we're also providing um, an archive, it's a tape archive, uh, which will grow, the current plan is for us to grow to 500 petabytes of data for the five years uh, for which Blue Waters will be operational. We're also providing external networking so people can move their data back and forth from this machine to their, their home institution. We also build a building. This is a big computer, the facility that we had uh, was not sufficient. We're very proud of this building, it's ready. It's a very modern building, very efficient. If you look there in the corner, it has a PUE, at this moment estimated between 1.1 and 1.2. Typical data centers will go around 1.9. And this is the, the ratio between how much power goes into the building and how much is used by the actual computer. Um, besides uh, those activities that relate directly to the infrastructure, we also established an educational program around the Blue Waters project. We had, uh, for example, a virtual school. Um, we also have an undergraduate educational program. For the virtual school, we had three summer schools this year. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we want, we had 70, 725 students, and we grew this program. We started with 42 participants in 2008, and then we grew it to this uh, impressive numbers. Um, the courses were offered at Illinois, some of them, some of them at remote sites. For each of these courses, we had uh, 10 sites using high definition um, video connection, Polycom, and it was uh, very well received. These are the the sites here, and um, we would like to see put you on this list next time. Uh, I'm talking here not only as the project manager for Blue Waters, but also a representative of the Great Lake Consortium from Petascale Computation. Um, when we put the proposal together, we realized that there is so much brain power in the Midwest, and so many resources, and so many smart people that we want to use that that um, uh, strength. Um, well, we c call this the Great Lake Consortium, but then so many people got excited about our plan, so geographically it might not reflect the Great Lakes unless you count some smaller lakes in Texas, I don't know, but <laughs> we, um, this is the, the, the um, these are our uh, charter members of the Great Lake Consortium, and um, of course, Purdue is on the list. Um, great, the Blue Waters uh, system will be used for a variety of, of uh, science and engineering application. Uh, NSF has already, um, so this is just a teaser here. Um, NSF has already launched a, um, uh, a program for applying to Blue Water Resources. It's called the PRAC solicitation. You, that's the link to the NSF site. And um, NSF has already made a first round of, of awards, 18 PIs. And this is basically a, a very important difference that we have between TerraGrid and, um, and Blue Waters that we're going not for thousands of PIs, but of tens, maybe hundreds. So therefore, collaboration is very, very important. The next round is in March, uh, this coming year. And here is basically why you have to apply to PRAC, for a PRAC award. This is the main avenue to get a Blue Water allocation. In the meantime, we'll also get you a lot of support from NCSA. If you don't want to apply for the PRAC award yet, there are other avenues, and this is work with the consortium. And here you have some names here. Um, you can talk to Maxine, she's the JLCPC president. There are two people here at Purdue that are members of the consortium. They are an excellent resource. Uh, the the um, consortium will have access to some cycles on Blue Waters, and that's a very, way, a very easy way to, 
to get access to the system. We also have a lot of educational activities. If you or your students are interested, these are all open. Scott is our representative. Just get in touch with him and, um, and um, 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 this will be a very exciting pro uh, project. And it's gonna be on the floor very, very soon. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, the notion of a campus grid. Uh, if we, if we uh, I like the, all, all four of these presentations are here together because it kind of gives you a nice picture. If you think of uh, the National Cyber Infrastructure as a pyramid, uh, Gabrielle mentioned that the OSG is a consortium of, of um, universities who can share their resources together. Um, the Terra Grid is a higher level than the pyramid, which gets more powerful resources and less users. And obviously Blue Waters is the very tip top of that pyramid. Very powerful things for much less uh, a much lower number of people. But the campus grid is a thing that you, that you can see a lot, of, a lot of resources at the very bottom of the pyramid that it's all based off of. Uh, so what exactly is a campus grid? Um, I, I always tell people that fundamentally the campus grid is just a way to share computing resources. Um, when you say campus, it's not necessarily a college campus. Many other places um, implement campus grids, whether they're corporations, national labs, anything that, that, that um, has a you know, common environment. Um, it allows an institution to build a cyber infrastructure using its existing investment in information technology. So the institution doesn't have to go out and spend millions and millions of dollars to build a blue water type of machine or even a machine like we have here at Purdue like Steel or Rossman. Um, who, uh, who are the people that do this? Uh, Purdue obviously is, is, a, is a place that does a campus grid. But we're not the only ones. Um, as you can see here from the graph, there's a number, of the, from the picture, there's a, a number of, in, of universities that do this. Um, certainly, I know several of these are represented here. I think there's folks from Indiana, Notre Dame. Um, Wisconsin, obviously, is, is a major campus grid um, proponent for reasons we'll learn about here, here in a bit. Fermilab has a very large and active campus grid. And a number of uh, financial services uh, institutions and, um, and companies use, use campus grids to um, get work done on machines that they've already paid for and that are already sitting there sucking down power, um, just waiting for something to do. Um, just as a side, you've heard over the last couple of days, you've heard the word Diagrid mentioned. Um, Diagrid is a Purdue-led consortium of a number of institutions that have agreed to share their, their resources together. So not only can a campus grid share unused resources within the institution's boundaries, but with just a little bit of extra technology, um, uh, those of us here at Purdue can share our, um, our unused machines with our neighbors up at Notre Dame or Wisconsin or, or even with Indiana. <laughs> uh, so about resource sharing here at Purdue, uh, we've already heard several times about our community cluster program. This allows us to combine our faculty's resources into one larger machine and, um, and share the idle capacity with, uh, with our colleagues at the, at the, um, at the university. And this, uh, this is definitely something that I know Gabrielle referred to during, during his presentation. And um, we also use cycle scavenging. Uh, Purdue publishes a data digest every year with facts and figures about, uh, about the university for whoever wants, wants to know things. Uh, in 2009, the publication said that there are 27,000 desktop computers around campus. Um, so assuming a conservative estimate if, these, if a lot of these machines are a couple years old, if there's two cores for, for each of these computers, that means that right now, sitting out there in people's offices while somebody's eating lunch, there's 50,000 cores of computing capacity lying there unused. Uh, and, th and that's at Purdue alone. So in order to share these cycles and uh, scavenge these from around campus, we use a software package called Condor. So Condor, this, this could mean a lot of things. It could be a, a cheesy 80s movie or a, or a scavenger bird. Or in our, in our case, uh, Condor is a software package developed uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Condor's been around for probably getting on 20, 20 years now. It was started as a hunter of idle workstation uh, when, machine, when workstations were uh, much more scarce and you'd only have a couple of deck stations or something sitting around your, your, your department. So when you're not using these, they're very expensive um, and, and, um, and you, could, you could share it with, with your colleague down the hall. They run your simulation while he goes out to lunch and vice versa. Uh, today, it's evolved into a general purpose batch system. I know Fermilab ha runs um, thousands and thousands upon nodes, node clusters with Condor as its batch system. Uh, it has wor workflow tools uh, 
um, that can that can handle your workload, would do job dependencies, send off more jobs, manage job submissions into TerraGrid or the Open Science Grid. Like I, I, I know the LSST folks have used um, used Condor Dagman and other things and Condor Glide-ins um, to to make their work possible that Gabrielle described. So Condor is a technology that makes our campus grid at Purdue uh, possible. So when a when a machine's not used by its owner, Condor can run real codes on it. So our community clusters and the Condor resource are, are inextricably tied together. Condor runs on the cluster nodes uh, when, when, the, when the machine's owner isn't using them through its primary batch system, PBS. Uh, Condor is free to schedule jobs on it. So it's, we've got a couple, little, couple extra layers of cycle scavenging there. Uh, this, this graph kind of gives you a picture of, of, the, of the extra little, little bit of usage we can squeeze out of a cluster. The, the red here is what Condor perceives as machines being used by their owner. In this case, this is the, the PBS usage of a cluster. And in a lot of cases, it looks like it's probably 90% oh, or so utilized by the cluster, but on a 15,000 node cluster, 10% that's not used is a pretty significant chunk of processors. So by running Condor in this manner, we can get nearly, uh, I think we ran a number once as probably 98.3, uh, 99% uh, utilization. So just a little bit of blue there that shows that it's not being used by anybody. So not only on the HPC clusters can we uh, scavenge cycles, but we've got um, Condor that we can run on desktops. I, I, I used a figure of 27,000 machines around campus uh, that are theoretically available. Uh, today we operate, we run Condor on our centrally operated um, student labs. There's machines all over campus. There's one down the hallway that I'm sure a number of you saw that the students, when they're not checking Facebook or, 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 or tweeting, are um, just sitting there doing nothing. And in these case, a lot of these are quad core machines, eight gigs of memory, and you can do some real science on these things. So we run Condor on about 8,000 cores of that. Uh, people who, who have centrally supported uh, Dex desktops can get Condor submitted, um, installed remotely by their administrator. Um, and kind of as an aside for those of you that aren't, at, that aren't from Purdue, the I, IT is moderately centralized. We do have a, a central office and a lot of people have some sort of, a, of, of reporting relationship uh, to, the, to the central. Um, but large numbers of those 27,000 machines aren't operated by ITAP. Um, there's distributed IT organizations all around campus. For example, the College of Engineering, Computer Science, Management, uh, and so on all have their own IT organizations. And in many cases, there's a lot of machines. Engineering alone, I think, has four or 5,000 machines that they operate um, that, w that we have to work with their administrators to, um, to, uh, get, uh, to get cycles from them. So, so we, we want, it's in our interest to make this as, as easy for them as possible. We provide uh, pre-configured managed packages to make it easy on the administrator. So here, take this exe file that, that installs Condor pre-configured uh, Linux package and so on. Um, but the, uh, the key takeaway from this is that building a campus grid on your campus, if you're interested in doing it, it's not really a technology problem. If you have IT administrators that are running machines in, in any, any large number, um, adding a software package is pretty easy for them. It's definitely a people problem. Uh, you have to convince everybody that the scavenging these cycles is a good thing to do, it's a safe thing to do, and it's worth their time. So Condor gets us an unexpected bonus. Um, over the last year or two, uh, we've been um, asked to um, save some money. Uh, $15 million, in fact, of, of IT cost savings over three years. Uh, one of the nice things about this is the power, the power reduction um, counts. So if we're able to save the power that people are um, drawing on their workstations, then that's a win for everybody. Um, and fortunately, as luck would have it, Condor is now capable of managing power on these machines. So when there's no work to be had, um, Condor can say, well, you know, Carol's desktop isn't doing anything, so I'll just send it a, a hibernate command and it'll, and it'll go to sleep. It won't draw any power. Um, so this is a win for everybody. Both the scientists and the accountants get what they want. There's a dashboard that we're, that we're working on prototyping to show um, how much power somebody can save there. You can see kind of at the top that the College of Science Administration has been gracefully testing this out and has saved some number of kilowatts of power. So we're looking forward to having wider distribution of this in the, in the near future. Okay, great, this is, th th this is awesome, but how, but how useful is this? Um, the campus grid is perfect for loosely coupled serial, serial jobs, much like, the, like Gabrielle described with the open science grid. And you may wonder, well, we heard about blue waters in the terror grid with these powerful machines, but who, who cares about these desktops? Doesn't everybody need a, a huge expensive cluster for their parallel jobs? So here's an example of what, of what you can do with a campus grid. A couple years ago, um, some, some folks at Indiana did a study of jobs on the terror grid. Uh, they found that 66% of all the jobs run on the TerraGrid over that, over that time span were single CPU jobs. 
of those of those uh, jobs, 80% of them ran for two hours of less, two hours or less, which is a which is a really good match for uh, an opportunistic resource like resource like Purdue. Um, from November 2008 and to November of 2010, uh, 30, 35.4 million uh, single CPU jobs were were run, uh, with 40 million. Um, 40 million hours of, uh, of time, with an average run time of one and a half hours. And we, we, we have heard about a couple of these science, uh, science stories here, and these are just a, uh, an example of, of some of the science that using exclusively the, the uh, opportunistic campus grid at Purdue has made possible. We heard about the Wikipedia project from Carol just a few minutes ago, um, several, several researches such as, such as the, uh, the Epsilon 15 virus and the, the Comet study were published in, in fairly prestigious uh, journals. And that's all work that they couldn't have gotten done without uh, the campus grid resource. So, in summary, uh, uh, we we we, uh, we advocate to everybody that the campus grid is a great way to create a pretty powerful cyber infrastructure on your existing um, IT equipment, and that you know for for little extra work is a very powerful uh, resource that a large amount of work can get done uh, that can help uh, a large large number of scientists. So and that's the end. Well, it looks like I haven't done as a good a job as I wish I did. So we're kind of running late, and we're going to um, take a couple of questions. Preston, what's the most dramatic use of the campus grid in Condor that you've seen in the recent years? Um, dr dramatic in the in the sense of, of heavy usage or most interesting? Most interesting. Most interesting. I think I think the the Wikipedia project that we've heard about several times is is one of the most interesting uses. It's, uh, the the social sciences obviously are, are are less represented than what we've what we've seen on Carol. For example, on Carol's pie graph, where the where the biologists and astrophysicists are the are the are the the, the obvious users of of, a, of an HPC resource. So the, the Wikipedia project I think is interesting in that way. Yeah, this is for Carol. It was pretty obvious on your graph of, of who uses the TerraGrid resources at Purdue that Purdue itself doesn't use many of those resources. Is that because we use other people's resources or because we don't, because we're on campus, we don't use TerraGrid very much? There was a middle part I didn't quite catch. You're saying um, on the people who are using Purdue resources? From Purdue. From Purdue. Oh. Okay, I, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. When yesterday, when I uh, this morning, when I pulled in the figure, um, um, I think a lot of the uh, Purdue researchers they're using other systems uh, for, for big amounts uh, of CPU time. For example, Gerhard Klimek, the uh, NCN folks, they they use a large amount of time on super large machines like Kraken and, and uh, Ranger. And I also know some petascale, other petascale projects at Purdue, they're also running on Rangers because they need um, a lot of processors simultaneously, which Purdue system doesn't really give them that. And, uh, and then also because may, uh, some of our Terrigal users, they, they're actually owners of the community clusters and they use their, their um, um, portion of the, the cluster. were oh, requested to turn off computers when you get off work <laughs> to save energy, then when the PCs are turned off, you have no access to those computers, right? Yep, that's correct. And also, how about, uh, well, so that is the issue about push balance. You cannot control faculty not to turn off computer. <laughs> <laughs> and also, another question about laptop. When you, you have no access to those laptops, even though they're connected to the computer, to the network. Yeah, that, that, that's probably accurate. Most, well, many, many laptops aren't, aren't, aren't involved. I don't know, does the president's laptop have Condor running? I, I, I know her desktop at one point did. Probably still does. Um, Bill? I 
Doing the research or allocations on the on the terror grid recently. Uh, in the past 12 months, we have about 30, 32 Purdue researchers with terror allocations, and they have been awarded over 56 million hours. And and the bulk of that was on other sites like Kraken. Purdue is Bill Whitson. He 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 knows uh, how to work TerraGrid. So if you ever want to write a TerraGrid uh, request for a large amount of CPU time, go talk to Bill. He has a lot of good pointers on what not to say to uh, get your time. <laughs>